Jella, and thank you everybody for coming and, and bearing the, uh, the ring, but I guess you're all used to it by now. Uh, as Jella said, my name is Justin McKinley. I am on my way to becoming the longest intern in the history of the Institute at Erie. Um, seven months in, so we'll see how long it lasts. Uh, and I think, just to get things started, I'm going to answer the most obvious question that's on everybody's mind. And that's the, uh, the fact that the mango and rice, they don't equal each other. So, why am I working with mangoes? And to answer that question, I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman that some of you may know already, uh, Mr. Bart Duff, excuse me, Dr. Bart Duff. Uh, he was an Erie Agricultural Economist from 1970 to 1990. So, some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, the, the version of Bart that I know is slightly different, though. I know Bart Duff as the CEO of Poor No More, and it's uh, a more laid-back version, I believe. And in this picture, it's quite literally a more laid-back version of Bart Duff. Uh, I had the, the good fortune of working with Bart and his wife, Paz, with uh, the NGO they're running called Poor No More in Port of Princess of Palawan. So they, they do a variety of issues, and Bart used his background as an economist working with tourism, energy, uh, Paz works a lot with incubated kitchens, and they're working with product development, typically in in, uh, in food, trying to develop small food products that the uh, more rural Barak guys can, can use as a source of income. Uh, and as I said, I, I spent three months there, uh, two and a half months, October to December last year, living and working in Palawan. And I had two tasks originally working with BART. One was to develop an ecotourism trekking trail from Irwan to Sepulkan, which is uh, the east coast of, of Palawan to the west coast, and uh, evaluate the value-added mango processing industry for the island of Palawan. Unfortunately, this ant had to go away because we found great success with the, with the trekking trail, which I guess is good news. And if you'll excuse me just for, for one second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna diverge from mangoes for the second time in my career to, to talk about this trekking uh, so we, here's the, uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of it. This is the beginning, uh, my colleague Matt and I with our guides, and this is Irwan Falls, the beginning of the trail, it's a 35 kilometer truck. Uh, you can see Matt again in the bottom left hand corner, he's a documentary filmmaker and he's shooting from the summit of Mount Beaufort, which gives you uh, beautiful views of, of not only the, the Sulu Sea, but also on the other side you see the South China Sea, so 360 degrees almost of water. This is the mother tree in Sepulkan is towards the end of the trek. And uh, it's actually, it's more impressive in person. I think some of you are thrown off by the uh, the giant American standing in front of it because normally it looks much bigger. And then at the, at the very end of the trek, you're met by the South China Sea in Sepulkan, which is this vast forest of rolling hills and uh, really a beautiful area. And um, this project just received a 3 million peso grant to move forward to the next phase of development, which is great news for the people of Sipuka. Uh, okay, back to mangoes. That didn't take too long. The first time I, I digressed from mangoes, it took me an entire year to get back to it, so I'm doing better. Uh, so let's talk about the national level. Uh, agriculture, as many of you in this room know, is very important to the economy of the Philippines. Uh, according to the, the fact book in 2010, it represented 13.9% of the GDP, and more importantly, 33% of the labor force, which is approximately 13 million Filipinos. Uh, mangoes, mango seeds, and guava are also very important to the Philippines, representing 462 million US dollars in production in uh, 2009. And in 2009, the Philippines ranked 10th globally for the production value and production weight in mangoes, mango seeds, and guava. Uh, so the, the data that we used for this study comes from the FAO country stat. And we have data for yield production and the area planted to mango. So first I want to talk about the area planted to mango at the national level. Uh, I'm going to run through a series of maps and I want you to pay special attention to Luzon and Mindanao, and more specifically, uh, Pangasinan, Maguindanao, Nepal del Sur, and Zabalanga del Norte. And for those of you who aren't completely familiar with where they are in the map, I've taken a little of giving you a quick overview. Um, I guarantee you by the end of this presentation you'll know where Pangasinan is on the map. So if we, if we watch area plants it, as we go through time, uh, you'll see that the, the, the most interesting part is that eventually you see this quick growth right now in uh, Mindanao. You see all these provinces in Mindanao that are, that are increasing the area planted 
rather, rather quickly. So then what we have is when we compare side by side 1990 to 2009, you can see the, uh, these particular uh, regions have really darkened. So what does that mean specifically? What's, what's interesting about area planting? Uh, Pangas Nan has the, the most area planted. It was true in 1990 with 8,485 hectares, and it was still true in 2009 with almost 14,000 hectares. Uh, Mindanao is an emerging supplier. Mindanao alone increased the area planted 21 fold from 1990 to 2009. And uh, now they've become the sixth highest province in terms of area planted in the whole of the Philippines. Also, we see the Babel Sur. The, the second highest area planted, and Zabuanga del Norte is fourth highest. So a lot of a lot of Mindanao has really uh, become a major player in the, in the market for mango. Okay, yield. Uh, Luzon and Mindanao. And again, I want you to look at Pangasinan, but this time uh, I'm seeing And there we are. And there we are. Okay, so. One thing that's interesting, when you watch this yield, you see this natural ebb and flow with the yield. Uh, particularly in Luzon, you'll see darkening and lightening through the years as they have higher yields and lower yields, and higher yields and lower yields, and it just keeps changing. And then what we have in the end, if we look at the map side by side, you can see that the that Congress amount has still increased a lot, and Mr. Sosa Dental has also increased quite drastically. But the other thing to note is that in this picture, there's not too many, uh, not too many dark spots on the map in terms of yield. And the reason for that is that uh, well, Pakistan had the highest yield, but they had 540 kilograms per tree higher than the next closest on average, which is, uh, or excuse me, 992 kilograms higher than the next province, which was uh, Mr. Sosa Dental. And then you see another large gap between them uh, and the following. And also the, the growth for this is also and that's why I wanted to call attention to this. They have the largest growth in yield. They went from 160 kilograms per tree in 1990 to 447 kilograms per tree in, in uh, 2009, or 280% approximately. And that's 148 kilograms per tree higher than Kazan. Uh, in terms of production, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Does anybody want to guess what province I want you to look at in Luzon? Pakistan, of course. Uh, Cebu, the Bible of Sur, and Zabo, the Elbote, again. And in terms of production, uh, well, here we are. Probably remember that one. Cebu, here's Zabo, the Norte, and finally, the Bible of Sur. And much like the yield map, when you look in terms of production, you see something that's tied to yield, the, the natural up and flow that's, that's occurring, where you'll see dark, darkening and lightening as we go through uh, through this time series map. So this is 2005, 2007, and finally 2009. If you compare them side by side again, you can see the differences from 1990 to 2009. And uh, the biggest difference really, again, is in Mindanao in terms of production. You see a lot more red than yellow than what you did in the beginning. Uh, so, Pakistan had the highest mango, they were the highest mango producing province. Uh, Cebu is the second highest producer, and it's a big difference between the two. Uh, and then, Mindanao has high growth in production. Again, you see that. So, Dabao del Sur and Zabuanga del Norte both are producing approximately six times more mangoes in 2009 than they were in. 1990. So now to be a little more specific, to talk about Palawan. The, the land area in Palawan is a little under 2 million hectares. About half of it is forested, and uh, there's about 500,000 hectares of agriculture. It's known as the last ecological frontier, and as such, it has 232 endemic species and 11,000 square kilometers of coral. And for better or worse, something that comes along with being an ecological frontier is that a lot of your people are involved in extractive services. So a lot of the people in Palawan are working with fishing. They were just, uh, just announced the largest supplier of the Philippines in the second quarter of this year. Uh, there's mining in the southern part of Palawan. They have farming as a, as a big part, and also their natural gas and oil extraction services. 
So it's the same same time period, 1990 to 2009. And for the production, the Blau and Mango went down 30%, while well, the national mango production increased by 70% in the same time period. Yield, you see a very big decrease for Blau and it's, it's decreased 50% from 1990 to 2009. And then the area planted, surprisingly, has almost doubled in the same time period. So we'll, we'll discuss that a little later. And the reason is this little critter. And this is the mango pulp weed when it's caused all sorts of problems for the mango industry in Palawan. Um, there's a mango quarantine. The Fili uh, Palawan is the only province in the Philippines with a mango quarantine. And it was, it was by the Bureau of Plant Industry Order Number 20 in 1987. The mango pulp weevil is believed to have originated in, um, oh, I'll, <laughs> I'll get back to it. Okay, so, production. If you look, you can see that at the beginning of our uh, study period, we have about 8,500 metric tons of production, and there's a really big decrease, in, and you'll notice, pay special attention to all these graphs especially, you'll notice the big differences between 1990 and 1998 about, sometime in that time period. So you see a, a very sharp drop off in the production, and then you see uh, a, a slight increase in sort of more of a plateau towards the end. And the, the thing that's interesting about production in Palawa is that at the beginning of the study period, 1990, which is still already three years past the implementation of mango quarantine, the study has a disadvantage of not having pre-mango pulp weevil data available. Uh, we were still, Palawan was still the 15th highest producing province in the Philippines, three years after the quarantine. But now, you move forward 20 years, in 2009, they've fallen to be the 29th highest producing province. And like I stated earlier, at the same time the allowance production was down, the national production was up. Here we have area planted. And again, this is, uh, like I said, 1990 to 1998 has a, a very sharp increase here, and then you see more of a plateau. So the, the thing that's interesting about this to me, and I think the two questions that originally came to my mind were, why continue planting with the quarantine? And secondly, why would you plant so much with the quarantine? And the answers came sort of easy. Uh, mango tree takes about 10 to 15 years to bear fruit and become economically viable. That means it takes about 10 to 15 years before it shows up on a graph like this as well. Um, secondly, the uh, highest growth rate is until 1999 in this graph, which is 12 years after the mango pulp weevil discovery and sequential quarantine, which means most of these trees that we see now are pre-mango pulp weevil. Uh, and why plant so much? There was a project during the 1980s that was being implemented by the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines that was pushing for intensive and widespread planting of mango trees uh, in Palawan. And unfortunately, the, the mango pulp we were discovered in the, the late 80s, and that effort was uh, kind of at a loss. So the end result is that Palawan's area planted to mango has nearly doubled during our study period. Uh, and now to look, at, to look at yield, if you look at the beginning of the study, there really isn't that much difference between Palawan and the national average for yield. And then you see again sharp decreases from 1992, let's say 1998. And the thing that's interesting is that in every graph that we've looked at, you see this very drastic change in the beginning. And what, that's, what that is is really it's just the, the market in Palawan, the mango market, sort of adjusting. It takes, it takes some time for the farmers and the whole supply chain to find its new equilibrium. So that's what we see over and over again. And the national yield has increased quite a bit, and then you see in the past few years it's decreased. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the declining yields aren't just for Palawan over, over this time. It's uh, also a national problem. So the national yield went down 25% in the study period. In the same period, Palawan is a by 50%, which is certainly a bigger problem. The yield gap, if we look at the beginning, at 16.88 kilograms per tree difference between Palawan and the, the average yield for the whole of the, of the Philippines. And then we see a, in 1998, we see the biggest difference between the two, which is 121 kilograms per tree difference. And then towards the end, it's back to 42.9. 
the, the yield gap, the difference between 1990 and 2009, though, is hardly to do with Palawan. And that's when the national goes down, 46%. Palawan has a slight increase in the same time period of, of 2%, but it's mostly the national that's causing that yield gap to shrink there. And essentially what's happening is that with no access to external markets, the Palawan mango farmers just have no incentive to produce mangoes. So you leave them on the tree because you can't sell them. So what does this mean for the farmers, the economic impacts? Uh, there's a couple of questions that we asked yourself at the beginning of the study. One being, how much is the mango quarantine cost the farmers of Palawan? The other being, how much is the mango quarantine cost the retail economy of Palawan? And we answered the question in, in two separate ways. First of all, we said, what if Palawan grew like its neighbors? And then the second was, what if Palawan maintained its national position in mango production? And I'll discuss these two uh, in more detail. So, to start, just um, the boring stuff, all values that I'm going to report are in 2010 dollars, US dollars. And I adjusted for inflation using the US CPI. And the reason I did that was I originally used the agricultural CPI of the Philippines and I was getting higher results than I was comfortable with. There was, um, in the beginning of the study period, there were very high uh, inflation differences and that was causing at the same time that we had higher levels of production, according to our, our model, they, we were also getting a very high rate. So the numbers were overinflated, in my opinion, so we adjusted. And to compensate for it, that's, that's why we chose to report in US dollars rather than in pesos. The farm gate prices we use, the prices for green caraval mango. And when we use retail prices, we use ripe caraval mango. And this is also something that has the potential to cause overestimation because it receives a hard mic. High market price, and we also didn't adjust for any post harvest losses. So, rather quickly, um, here's some of the equations the total loss is the attainable value minus the actual value. And to figure this out, we have 20 years of data, and this is really to say that the, the actual value is the summation of actual production of Palawan multiplied by the real price. And the attainable value is about the same, attainable value is the summation the attainable uh, production of Palawan multiplied by the real price. And the difference that we had, remember, we had uh, option one and option two, the difference is all in this part of the equation, P hat. So, going back to it, what if Palawan grew like its neighbors, and what if Palawan maintained its position in national mango production? It's a matter of P hat. This is how we figure the attainable production for a neighbor's growth. And we're simply saying attainable production is the growth rate of Numeropa minus Palawa applied to the base year production of 1994 for Palawa. So this more simply is saying if Palawa grew like its neighbors, this is what it would look like. So we see, you see they start together because we're using the original base year data for Palawa. And then we just assume the growth rate of Numeropa minus Palawa's growth rate. And this is what we got over the years. Um, it had sharp increases in the beginning, and then towards the end, it tapers off. So what it means is that actual production was valued at 71.85 million US dollars over 20 years, and our attainable production at the farm gate level is 144 million, 0.63. Uh, in the difference is 72.28 million, or 3.64 million annually for the farmers if they grew like their neighbors. And for the retail economy, 142 is the actual, and 295.09 is the attainable. A difference of 152.54, or $7.63 million annually. And going back to this, um, we've already answered the first one, what if Palau and grew like its neighbors. So the second one, the way that we did PHAT is we, let's assume that the distribution of, of the Mango production in the Philippines looks something like this normal curve. We have the, the mean here, and then we have the standard deviation, which is the spread. And what happens is, using the base year 1990 data, we find that the one exists somewhere here on the curve. It's 0.14 standard deviations above the mean. So we asked what if Palawan maintained that position in the national average, and what if Palawan consists, uh, consistently stayed at 1.14 uh, standard deviations above the mean. Well, that looks something like this. You can see the, the numbers here are going to be a little bit bigger. The original 
climb goes a little higher, and then you see it maintain a higher value for longer, but still in the end it eventually starts to decrease. And here's, here's, what, they, oh, excuse me. here's what, they, what they look like side by side. Um, so yeah, you can see that the, the right side is going to give you more, more attainable production. So with the same actual farm gate price, but the attainable this time is 178.42 million. A difference of 106 this time, which is uh, 5.33 million US dollars annually. And retail level, again, it's the same for actual. The attainable is increased again to 372, with a difference of 230.43. And that's $11.52 million annually. So the economic impacts, how much does the mango quarantine cost the farmers of Palawan? Depending on how you look at it, it costs 3.64 to 5.33 million annually, or since 1990, it's cost 72.28 to 106.57 million dollars. Uh, the retail economy suffered more, 7.63 to 11.52 annually, or 152 to 230 million US dollars in total. So what do we do now? There's really, in, the, in this discussion, we identified two people, and we assigned these two specific topics for them, but really the, the actual is going to be a collaboration between policymakers and private enterprise. Neither one is going to be able to do these on their own. But for the policymakers, we've identified that it's time to end the mango quarantine under strict regulation, which is very, very important. Um, and for the private enterprise, it's the creation of a value added mango processing industry. So for the policymakers, the argument is this. The technology has changed immensely since 1987 when this mango quarantine was originally in place. The utilization of x-rays and post-harvest has become more popular and is becoming very reliable. And it's a non-destructive form of, of checking for things like the mango pulp wiggle. It's a value-added process. There's already a, an x-ray machine in Palawan that's uh, providing more value to the, to the mango growers because once the mango has been scanned, it's receiving a higher price at the market in Palawan. And most importantly, it makes them safe for export. And that's the biggest issue. Um, but again, this requires very strong supervision because there's serious consequences to the export of the mango pulp wiggle. This is already a problem for Palawan. We don't want it to be a problem in the Philippines. And private enterprise. Well, mango quarantine is on fresh mangoes, not processed mangoes. And that's something that seems to be forgotten and lost in the shuffle. You can still export a processed mango, but not a fresh one. Um, the trouble is that there's, there's no mango processing in Palawan. So there's all this value that could be there that's just completely uh, left alone. So this creates a, a new value-added mango processing industry for the whole of Palawan. So not only does this provide farmers with with uh, a new market for their mangoes, it's also providing Palawan with jobs in a new industry. Um, and it provides us with products like these. Um, so my argument is that the time to act is now, and I say this for a variety of reasons. First of all, the national production is falling. Uh, secondly, Palawan's production has room to expand right now. When they're, when they're yielding at 50% of what they were originally, and their area planted has increased, I think that it's, um, in the, it's very likely that they can you know, uh, make some, some pretty serious contributions to the production of the whole Philippines. Uh, the technology is available, and I'm not just discussing the extra technology for post-harvest management, but also the, the technology is available for processing. So either way you look at it. Um, the mango, there's a recently formed Mango Growers Association in Palawan, and there's already talks of a conditional lifting um, that's being pursued by the Mango Growers Association. They're citing large financial and job losses. And so ultimately it's time for Palawan to adopt new technologies to move their mango industry forward. And I want to take this time to thank uh, my co-authors, uh, Dr. Valpede, Adam Sparks and Bart Duff. And of course, a very special thank you to all of you for taking the time to come up with something today.
include. Thank you, sir. Can we now, we now open the floor for questions and comments about this presentation? Anyone in the audience would like to ask? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you for your insights on this uh, mango industry. But I'm sorry I didn't quite get the reasons why you chose those areas like Pangasinan and Cebu. Uh, why didn't you look at Zambales? They, they also have good mangoes. Why not? Um, why didn't you get data from Guimaras, which is the other famous place? Well, thank you. And uh, naturally, there's there's a hundred ways that we can choose to to assign our, our attainable production. So the, the the reason that we were looking at these specific areas, everything the data that we had was at a provincial level, okay. and we had uh, these provinces. So so I'm, I'm wondering, are you asking specifically about why we didn't choose to say that? Um, well, yeah, I mean it's a valid it's a it's a valid argument because I mean one can say that that um, you know agriculture in Guam is much like agriculture in Mindanao. They're both sort of uh, ecological frontiers in some way, and there's still lots of room for production there. So I was showing that you know even half of Palawan is still forested land, so there there's lots of room for agriculture to grow there. So we we could have we could have chosen a hundred different ways to say that that the production would have acted, the attainable production. So we just uh, we took two simple ways of doing it, and you know you're you're absolutely correct. We can say that it would have grown like somebody else, um, but we chose we chose the neighbors because. Uh, because they're going to have similar growing conditions, similar weather, things of that nature. Uh, but the trouble is, before I mean, the before the, the start of the mango pulp weevil, Palawan was definitely the one that was most specialized in mango from in Europa. So that using that estimation is maybe deflating a little bit. We're not quite getting the, the full impact of it, and that's why we can. That's why we looked at it from another way, saying you know, it, it would maintain its national stance. Anyone else from the audience would like to ask a question or post a comment? Yes, ma'am, please. State your name and the institution where you are from. I'm Elvis Guerra from Post Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center here at UPLB. Uh, you have done some uh, analysis or some uh, modeling on what would be the impact if uh, if, the, uh, if there would be partial lifting of this uh, ban on uh, mangoes coming from Palawan, but have you done an analysis or an assessment of the risks uh, on the national uh, level in the case of mango production? If, for example, <laughs> some mangoes uh, with infested with pulp weevil came out of Palawan, even with this uh, X-ray technology, uh, because in the case of the mango pulp, we will have different stages inside the fruit. You have the egg, you have the pupa, the larva, etc., and the adult. No? So, for example, if uh, through X-ray uh, the egg was there and it was not uh, detected by the X-ray and it came out of Palawan, what would be the effect in the whole mango industry of the Philippines? Have you done any assessment of that? Uh, no, unfortunately, I haven't. That's a, I mean, that's a great suggestion for a future study and something I could potentially look into. Because I mean you're you're absolutely correct. The the impact would be <coughs> horrible for, for all the Philippines because I mean even if it isn't expanding to other provinces just to have a scare is gonna is gonna close some certain export channels for us, right? So I know there's uh there's with the US there's very strict there's very strict uh, requirements for the export and uh, we'd have a bigger problem because they're they're only coming from a couple of regions and uh, the Visayas and some of Mindanao is, is supplying uh, the U.S. But if we have this scare with the mango pulp weevil is moving outside of Palawan, then it could shut down these, these channels of export. And I haven't, I haven't studied this in, uh, I think it's a, a, a good idea in the future. And uh, just additional, this uh, value adding activities like processing, uh, I know that there have been several uh, studies or feasibility studies on the uh, potential of uh, processing and uh, some uh, government agencies like the OSD, uh, PICAR, have, uh, and even the National Mango Action, Pe Action Team, they have this project in Palawan on uh, processing of uh, mangoes uh, for value-adding activities. Uh, 
Do you have any idea as to why it has not um, uh, <laughs> taken uh, uh, take, this was not taken up by the uh, private group in Palawan this processing? Uh, I would say because there's a large upfront capital investment, so it's it's uh, it's scares some people to invest that much. I know Bart Bartoff is actually working with many people trying to get anybody to start a business there because you know the this study talks about the the impact to the economy of, of losses. But really there's a there's so much to gain there nobody's really accounting for the, the potential of, of growth and it's for for somebody who's who's looking who's shopping around for mangoes for processing, I think it's a great choice. But again it's that capital investment and there might be some sort of a, some sort of fear in putting that much money into an investment. Uh, may I add something to that? In uh, Miss Oak, they also have high production of mangoes. But to them, they find it cheaper to send it to Cebu for processing, which is actually distance near. So I think Palawan is also quite near Palawan to Cebu if they are thinking of processing. It's, it's basically that same reason. It's more expensive. And they can ship mangoes out of Palawan to Cebu. Well, no, but, but if, <coughs> yeah, you can you can send the fresh mango, but you can do something very simple like send the Palawan puree. You know, just mm -hmm. you can pulp you can pulp the mango and send it as pulp. Then it's okay. Uh, but no, not fresh. But it would, I mean that would still require some sort of capital investment in the beginning. But if you use a small operation like that in association mm -hmm. with somebody in Cebu, then then uh, yeah, the the capital investment is much smaller. But, but then again, the, uh, the overall value to the people of Palawan is maybe a little bit less because you're moving a lot of the, a lot of the jobs away from, from the island as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. One more question. Yes, for you. Just a mic. Good afternoon, I'm Lee Shong. I'm a mother of three students here at UPLB. <laughs> um, I come from Palawan, by the way. I would like to know if you could tell us uh, offhand uh, how much would be the capital investment you're talking about? And number two, could you tell us where these uh, mango trees are concentrated? Is it in the north or the south? Because my family has land holdings both south in Puerto Princesa and in the north in El Nido. I would a like to know if, investor, if, yeah. it's worth, uh, <laughs> if it's worth considering. Uh, as far as the concentration, I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure um, at, the, at a barangay level or where, where the trees are concentrated. I can tell you more that the, the trouble zone is in the south. It's the south of Palau that has mango pulp weevil. They have uh, mango pulp we will ignore because it, it's not an issue at all. It's still free of mango pulp. So, so maybe that's the better option for you. You can uh, buy from, from the north. Uh, and the production facility could be close to to the bay or to, to a port of Princess City where you're going to be exporting anyway. Um, but as, in terms of in terms of how much it would cost for something like this, it, I really can't answer. It's, it has too many variables. You know, it depends on what operation you want to do. Oh, I, I still can. I still don't know because there. I mean, you're already talking. I mean, how much how much dried mango do you want to produce? And there's, I mean, there's too many too many things that change the the output for me to, to just blindly give you a number. So, so I, I guess that's uh, hopefully something that potential investors will take the time to invest in. And, uh, I don't have to. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Uh, Am I the only one asking? <laughs> uh, have you uh, come across any insect ecology studies on the evil weevil? Why haven't they done anything on pest control? Or, or they're trying. They're trying. Um, I mean, that's. They're, they just received a 100 million peso grant uh, in Palawan to eradicate the weevil, but I mean, the trouble is they've been trying to eradicate the weevil since 1987. So this, is, this study is looking at a different option. That's that's the point. So, of course, it's best to find a source and work with it. But you know, it's also 
I mean, maybe maybe a mango processing is just a band-aid for a bigger problem. You know, eventually it's going to be the ultimate goal to eradicate the weevil, but in the meantime, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to have the entire province suffer for a few trees in the south. There have been uh, studies conducted on the uh, control of the mango pulp devil since the early 90s. And uh, even the, the uh, biology of the mango pulp devil, etc., ecology. And uh, uh, there has been, uh, there was uh, technology already on how to control the weevil, but it entails a lot, uh, the use of pesticides. And also it entails community effort. Because if one farmer, if one farm is uh, doing this uh, integrated pest management, but the adjoining farms are not doing it, then uh, you cannot really uh, get a good uh, high degree of control. So it takes a lot of effort, community effort, uh, in order to really uh, control or reduce to very low level the incidence of this mango pulp video. There have been studies, no? And they have done that in Palawan? Yeah, they have done that in Palawan, in Brooks Point, where uh, Brooks Point, the southern part, Brooks Point, Batarasa, wherein uh, they were able to show, Dr. Luela, uh, Luela Lorenzano was able to develop a technique on how to control. It involves uh, sanitation, uh, pruning, chemical control, to really reduce the level of the mango pulp people. But the problem is everybody should do it. Community power, then maybe the government should step in and get happy to step in to do it. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone for your uh, insights and comments and questions. I think we have room for one more. Yes, sir. So that when you when you produce a transformed cell, you can make that cell to grow into a transformed BT mango. The problem with mango is it, it's it's a woody plant, and woody plants are difficult to teach a culture. We are lucky to have a teach a culture system using uh, nucellus to form somatic embryos of mango and regenerate plants. And now we have 
the mangoes in the peel. The next part now is to put the gin in the mango. But hindi po bitikorn ang target namin. Yung sa Institute of Plant Breeding, ang target is for delayed ripening like in papaya. So that you can prolong the storage life of the mango. So siguro po maganda yung sinabi niyo that we can have a BT mango but baka mo sa next lifetime ko na yun. <laughs> Thank you. Huh? Mm.